Hello, everyone. Welcome to Feed Stuffs 365. I'm Sarah Muirhead. And with me today is Dr. Al Kurtz. Dr. Kurtz is a regular columnist on Feedstuffs and a, a regular makes regular appearances here on Feedstuffs 365. We talk uh, we talk dairy nutrition. Welcome, Dr. Kurtz. Great to see you again. Thank you, Sarah. It's good to see you on video, even if you couldn't have made it to ADSA. But <laughs> you know, I did get some comments uh, of people who still follow me regularly, so that's good. That's great. That's good. Yeah, yeah. And in, you're in, like I said, in the new digital issues, they can find your column as well as on our website, as well as, um, you know, hear further discussion of, of various topics right here on 365 each month. Our topic today, we're going to talk about calf starters and feeding programs. So um, let's focus a little bit on some of those key product formulation issues that uh, that we all need to be aware of. Uh, let's start with um, palatability. What's what's really important when we talk palatability in, in a calf diet? Well, calves have a really good taste. And at that young age, they can pull out components they like or don't like in a uh, starter. I've seen them do that. They just are almost like goats in their ability. So if they don't like what's in the pellet, they'll leave the pellet and eat the coarse grains or vice versa. So it's important that it be palatable. And one of the things that calves are like human babies, they like consistency. So they don't like change. And if you change a formula for a calf starter that much between batches and shipments, calves can pick up on that and they may back off for a couple of days. So any formulation changes should also be minimized because they don't like big changes. Now they can adjust to them over time, but it may be a couple of days before that happens. So they, they have ingredients they like, like they, they like soybean meal over other protein meals, but there's some other ingredients that they don't like, such as, uh, fish meal, blood meal, and even like corn gluten feed and corn gluten meal. So they have a good sense of palatability and we have to consider that in formulating uh, starters for calves. What about uh, pellet quality? That's, a, that's another issue and one that you and I have talked about quite a bit here in 365 and you've talked about in your columns, of course, but give us kind of a quick overview on on you know, what to pay attention to when it comes to pellet quality? Well, the main thing is you don't want fines in the calf starter. And that's true whether it's a pelleted starter or if it's a texturized starter, because calves don't eat as well when fines occur. There's one study that showed uh, where they created some fines about 11% less intake. So they don't like the fines. So that means you have to have a good quality pellet. That, uh, doesn't mean it has to be as hard as a rock. It just has to avoid crumbling that easily. And one of the best uh, ingredients for pellet quality is wheat mids, wheat middlings. And unfortunately, in some circles, that still has a bad reputation as a quote filler. But if you know the protein and the NDF and the starch level, and you formulate it properly, it's not a filler, it's a good ingredient. And where this can be a bit of a challenge is we have this, uh, what I would call a fetish of high protein starters, not just 20%, but 22 and sometimes 24 and 26% protein. Well, when you have that much protein, you don't have as much room for other ingredients, which can improve the pellet quality. So I can recall one situation when I was down in Texas a few years ago and the consultant asked me to look at this calf starter and I have a picture of it in my file where I'm holding it in my hand. It's a texturized starter, but there were quite a few finds. So I asked him about what the protein level was and it was like 22% or so. And I said, you know what? If you drop that down to about 18% on as fed basis, you can add some wheat mids and that'll give you a much better quality starter. And if you look at the 2001 dairy NRC young calf model and you put in typical milk replacer and starter intakes, uh, 
it never calls for any more than 18% crude protein on an as-fed basis or 20% on a dry basis. And people might say, well, you know, if the calves aren't eating enough, then they need a higher protein percentage. And I said, no, because if they're not eating enough, you're going to need to get them to eat more because it's energy that's short, not protein. So we really have to pay attention to the quality of the pellet. You mentioned wheat mids. Let's talk about a couple other specific ingredients and, and kind of the processing side of it. What's important to know when it comes to corn, oats, and barley? I know you've got some thoughts there. Yes, and, and there's a very good Penn State study done with corn in which they had a, uh, a well-texturized starter. Actually, it's a good formulation. If you want to look at it, it's contained. The references in the uh, in the article I wrote. And they had corn at 33%, 5% cane molasses, 16% whole oats, and the rest was a premixed pellet. So you had different forms of the corn. They had whole corn, dry rolled, roasted, rolled, and steam flaked. Overall, there wasn't that much difference, but there were some minor kind of key differences. For instance, the one that tended to have some negative effects on intake was the steam flake corn. Now, one of the issues with steam flaking is the variables can be quite wide ranging. And so the quality of the steam flaking can vary. Another issue is potentially that when you steam flake corn, you, you make it very flat. And depending on how flat it, flattened it is, it can crumble and that creates fines. Another factor is that in steam flaking the corn, you gel gelatinize to some extent the starch and you also uh, expose more of the starch. So this can lead to a mild acidosis under some circumstances in the calf. So that might be why the calves didn't do as well. So cracking corn is, is a good, medium to do. Uh, usually, if you're going to do that, about four to six particles per kernel are rolling it. It doesn't have to be steam flaked. Now, there's one case in which I found out a problem with cracking corn, and that was a study that I did in China in which they had very hard flinty corn, and we found out that it was so hard and flinty that even though it was well cracked, it had a lower digestibility than when it was um, all ground up. So if you had really hard corn, then you wouldn't want to do that either. Oh, you mentioned also uh, oats and barley. Okay. Oats and barley, yeah. Yeah, because for instance, this, this formula had 16% oats and a lot of times people would 10 or 15%. That is, neither one is necessary if you've got a, a well-texturized source of corn. Um, the thing about oats is sometimes then people want to also process it. And I say, no, don't process the corn, let the calf do it. Because the calf will chew it up and that's good for its rumination and salivation and, and modifying any potential acidosis in the rumen. So if you're gonna use oats, don't uh, process them. They don't need to be processed. On the other hand, uh, barley is a bit of a quandary because it's fairly round, has a lighter density. And I think because of that, it tends to go through the rumen and goes out into the manure. So that means you've lowered that digestibility. Now, if you uh, roll or steam flake barley, then you probably are processing the starch too much and the starch in barley is more highly fermentable than it is in corn. So if you're going to use corn, uh, barley, um, process a minimal, like maybe cracking or rolling, no steam flaking. So let's talk about the proportion of particles to pellets in texturized starters, which I know we've talked about this previously as well, and it's really not an exact science, but what, what's your recommendation there? Well, that's true. We talked about this back in March at a meta-analysis I was involved with, of which included texturized starters. And when we looked at the degree of texturization in the starter, we found that 
you probably should have a minimum of 40% up to 45% minimal of the texturized particles, whether it's corn or oats or barley. And unfortunately, it is not an exact science. And what's even more frustrating is a lot of times in the literature that uh, the studies will not indicate whether it's a texturized starter or not. And even if it is a texturized starter, then they should do particle size distribution so we can get more measurements of that. Now, along with that question often is, is what about molasses? Well, from studies I've done, I found that about three to 5% molasses is kind of the happy medium. You can get up to 10% or so, but then it starts becoming more sticky. And if you get really low, it becomes drier. So molasses are not absolutely necessary, but when you use them, try the midpoint. Now, you can have some issues with molasses. It can be quite variable and its stickiness can be variable and there's no good way of measuring that I think other than with your fingers and so if it's uh, at a higher level and more sticky in the winter time it can set up almost like a block if it's in bags and of course if you had it in bin it'd even be worse in the summertime particularly in the western climate with a, with lower humidity then it will dry out but the one potential benefit of molasses at a lower level is it would tend to accumulate any fines and keep that from being a limiting factor. I want to encourage anyone who's joining us here online to post your questions and we will uh, make sure we get those to Dr. Kurtz here as we, as we go forward. So starch and fiber levels, that can be another issue. Um, what, uh, what to keep in mind when we talk starch and fiber? Well, if the, if the uh, starter's all pelleted, that is a really critical factor because when your starch gets up to 40% or so with a pelleted starter without any forage, you're going to have mild acidosis and that's going to affect your intake and gain. But when we're talking about a well texturized starter, starch level is not a significant factor. 35 to 40% is not unusual. And that's not a problem because when the particles go into the rumen after calf has consumed them, they will regurgitate them like cows do and chew their cud. And when they do that, they reduce the particle size and swallow. And then they've also salivated a lot and they swallow the saliva and that's a great buffer. So that's why texturized starters work so well to prevent acidosis. On the other hand, if you lower the starch level in the pelleted starter, then you may not have enough starch for good rumen papillae development. And we have to keep in mind that the papillae of the rumen lining are developed in by primarily butyric, then propionic and last acetic. That's the order. But then we have to avoid acidosis. So Al, we do have a question here from the audience. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to formulate ionophores or, or decox? Um, can you walk through your process? Also, what's your, what's your view on estimating intake prior to weaning? The ionophores are good because uh, particularly one that's the uh, coccidio side that is it kills the coccyx that's what it, i would look for and you simply need to follow the directions of using that ionophore and then have some measure of intake to see how much uh, you would be providing the calves depending on what their consumption is as far as consumption of starter a key factor here is do what you can early on to encourage starter intake. And the reason why is because starter intake approximately doubles each week. So I cringe when I hear somebody say, well, I don't provide any starter in my calves because they don't eat much for two or three weeks. But maybe they only eat 50 grams a day, 100 grams a day in the first week, but then that doubles the second week and the third week. And so you've missed that progression if you wait too long to start. And then that means you're going to prolong the time at which you can wean them. Or if you wean them anyway, then you don't have as much starter intake for rumen development and rumen function won't be as good. And then after you wean them and you want to put them on a low level forage, 
they won't do as well. So you, you just have to keep those factors in mind. Very good. We thank you for, for submitting that question. We always appreciate um, any kind of questions you folks have. So feel free to uh, to submit those as, as we move forward here. Al, what about fat sources and addition levels of fat? Um, what should we look at when we talk calf starter and feeding programs? Well, Sarah, that sounds like a good idea to add fat because it's an energy source and we do that to cow rations. But with young calves in the first two months, it's generally negative. There are a number of studies, and I've got some of those referenced, that show that. And the reason why, I think, is because a young calf has a very low rumen pH. It's typically about 5.5, five, maybe down to 5. And that's what we would associate with cows is acidosis. But in a young calf, I think it's that low because they don't have a protozoa population. And they engulf starch and deaminate protein, and that helps keep the pH higher in cows than in calves. So it's like anything which could negatively affect protozoa either existing or establishing themselves as a population has a negative effect. And therefore, also the more um, unsaturated a fat source is added to a starter, the more negative the effect will be. So my recommendation is just avoid that at all. You want to have good intakes. You don't want to be doing things that would create intake decreases. And uh, also consider that some fat sources like whole cottonseed or roasted beans are negative in calf starters, as well as some distillers and other fat sources. Oh, here's one. There's definitely two camps uh, of thinking when it comes to pelleted versus texturized feeds. Um, and I know you've got an opinion on this. So, so walk us through your thinking. Well, I already talked a little bit about that when we talked about pelleted starters. You have to watch out for the starch level unless you're feeding some forage. And when you feed some forage, you may get some gut fill and that can distort what the real daily gain is if you're doing a study. And, and so we, we need to consider that. And that's why I prefer a texturized starter because it's safer, it's more foolproof, and you don't have to provide forage and try to manage that in the first two months. Because it, if you provide too much, then you're gonna start getting a gut fill. And how this all fits together is discussed uh, best by looking at this table in the article. And this was a study done in British Columbia with what they called, because that's what the manufacturer called it, a texturized starter. But it had 14% flatted barley, so that'd be like rolled barley, 13% flatted oats. And remember I said, you don't need to process oats and 10% steam flake corn. So all of those were processed and they only added up to 37%. So two of those didn't need to be processed at all. And the percentage is below that 40 to 45% range. Now, these were, uh, were male calves and they actually, at the end of that period of, um, of weaning, after weaning, they actually slaughtered them. But in the meantime, they had two treatments. They had an alfalfa hay available on the side with this starter or the starter by itself. And the conclusion was that the alfalfa hay benefited the calves. But when you look at their own slaughter data, we find out that the opposite was true. So you see that the digesta in the rumen reticulum of the starter alone was 17.6 pounds. When they also had available hay, it was 28 pounds. That's 10.4 pounds more gut fill in the calves when they had hay available. Now the calves weighed the same, basically. So that means there was about 10 pounds less true body growth when they had hay available with the texturized starter. So the real problem is seen because when you look at the pH, when the, what was called a texturized starter was fed alone, it was only a little over five. And when it had some hay with it, it was 5.5. Well, that means the calves were trying to, trying to buffer their own 
acidosis by eating the hay. So the solution is provide a better texturized starter. Don't process corn and oats if you don't need to and minimally process the barley if you're using barley and provide a minimum of 40 up to 45% of texture. And that's how you avoid that issue. As we start to wrap up here today, one more just a reminder, if you have any questions to feel free to post those. So Dr. Kurtz, what then is the bottom line and what, what's your opinion in terms of when it comes to these key product formulation factors, what should be considered just from a top level standpoint? Well, first of all, remember that calves are babies and we know babies like consistency and calves like consistency. So don't monkey with the formulation if you're doing a texturized starter. Try to keep it fairly constant so that that's not a variable in palatability and intake. And that's the other thing is make sure you keep that that formulation fairly constant. Don't do big swings because that causes the calves to go through cycles and in intake. And then I would recommend a texturized starter, but remember, keep at least 40 to 45% texture. If you're doing corn, you can get by with whole corn, maybe cracked at the most, maybe some rolling. I don't recommend steam flaking because I don't think it's necessary. It just adds cost. It may have a couple of negative consequences that we talked about. And then if you're providing oats, don't process it. Let the calf process it. Dr. Kurtz, always a, always a pleasure to have you with us. For those of you joining us here online, you can find Al's most recent column in the link down below, as well as um, you'll see it online and at feedstuffs.com and in our digital issue. So thank you, Al. Thank you so much. We encourage all of you to check feedstuffs365.com for upcoming program, programming. We have a lot in the works and we're posting new things on a regular basis. So be sure to check back there and also to watch your newsletters that come from Feedstuffs. We highlight a lot of those um, upcoming programming um, topics as well there. So for Feedstuffs 365, I'm Sarah Muirhead.